Good. Um, so thanks everyone for coming out. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in Berlin. I live in Kassel. Um, <laughs> I think that says everything. Um, so um, thank you very much for coming out. And um, so Emma and I will be doing this presentation and it's gonna be a kind of break from uh, what we've heard before and what we're going to hear after. Um, because um, it's very concrete, it's very specific. Uh, and I want to begin with this um, picture. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the phrase, Africa is now? A few. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the phrase, Africa is the future? Also a few. Um, so it's very interesting when you put these two uh, phrases next to each other, because if, um, Let's say it's 2003, and you come up with the slogan, Africa is the future. Then in 2013, people are still saying, Africa is the future. What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> 10 years have passed, but the future is still coming. But if in 2003 you say, Africa is now, and in 2013 you say, Africa is now, there's a kind of movement that means the future is always moving. The future is always happening in the now. And that's what um, uh, the essence of, of um, this phrase is. And that's why I, I like it very much. And so um, by means of exploring what it means um, for art and culture um, from African perspectives in the future, I think it's very important to look at what is happening now and to be very specific, because um, another phrase is Africa is not a country. And um, today we'll be focusing very specifically on Kenya, because that's what I, that's what we know, that's what we are familiar with. And we'll be giving you a few examples of what is happening um, in terms of cultural production, in terms of fashion, visual arts, and um, a few of these things. So, yeah. And for the first project, I'm just going to um, give it over to Emo to tell us, because it's his project. Okay, so um, I'm just going to take you through my now, and my project, what, what I've been doing for the past six, seven years, six years now, yeah, for the past six years, because I started a shoe company in 2012, at that time it was my now, and I decided, okay, I've seen an, a gap in the Kenyan industry and no one was making shoes at the moment. And I decided, okay, why not? Let me make shoes. Because I was modeling and I was doing a lot of runway shows and no one had shoes. So all the time as a model, they used to ask me, come with shoes, come with shoes, come with shoes. And I thought, okay, why isn't someone making shoes? Then I made shoes. And I thought, okay, I'd start this project and go to the US and continue modeling. But I honestly thought, it's something new and no one is doing it. Why can't I not do it further? And this project has really grown from that time, from 2012. And it culminated to two years back when I did a Kickstarter project. And in this project, then I was living here and I decided, okay, why can't I not produce shoes in the continent, in Africa, or in a country in Africa? and ship it to the rest of the world because the production capacity or what I had as my story I wanted to share it with the whole world. I think maybe you can show the Kickstarter video that I did. Because Nyala is an Amharic word meaning gazelle, 
and I think the Brazil embodies what we want to bring to the market the shoe. It's agile, swift, and basically just beautiful. And I think this shoe is that. I bought the Nyala collection which is a sheep leather above with a rubber sole, which is durable. Sheep leather, it's lighter compared to the other kind of leather. And this is why I love it, and this is why I chose sheep leather upper compared to, let's say, calf or any other. And when you wear the shoes as well, they really hug the foot, then it's really flexible. And it fuses well into every step one takes. We have the leather lining combined with the textile, mixes and matches perfect. I grew up in Nairobi and I think Nairobi is a city that's really energetic and it has a lot to offer in terms of design, energy, colour and this is what Nyala also has and this is what Nairobi has. In terms of design, quite <laughs> some are minimalistic but still maintaining to be cool. And this is what this shoe has, the best of both worlds. I had a desire to wear the shoes to an international standard. I had to look for a producer who can match what I had as expectation. And I found that in Ethiopia, this was the perfect place where they could do it. It has good sheep leather, it has good workmanship, it has good craftsmanship, and the people were ready to help me. So I was lucky enough to find someone who was able to believe in me. But I it's pretty much my style, you know, it's, it's simple, it's elegant, uh, it's not too sort of over bling bling. It looks very durable, it's very good, it looks tight. I like that. It's a nice shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so my favorite part of that is like this. Probably like those parts. Yeah, me too. Perfect. Yeah. 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 I really prefer this one. I think it's looking much cooler. I don't know, that's posted like here. Yeah. So when you walk normally, you should like always get an itching here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's really good. Yeah. I like the. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the European market, they're producing a lot for European companies, but they're not producing for African companies. So at the point where I was relating with them and I told them, okay, I want to produce shoes for my own company, it was a surprise to them as well, like, hey, why? Uh, <laughs> do you have money to pay? And it was difficult because there's an element of trust in terms of logistics as well. Uh, it's easier to ship shoes from Ethiopia to Europe than from Ethiopia to Kenya. So those were some of the difficulties that I came across. But I think these are the problems as developing countries or soon to be developed countries are facing. But I think it's just temporal because if I can come from Kenya, come to Germany, do a project and take the project back to Africa and do it for the rest of the world. And I think this is what we are talking about. We are moving across borders, we're moving across boundaries, and I don't really believe in Africa, Europe. I believe in a oneness where ideas can be exchanged between continents, between people. And this just showed that. And I'm not the only one who's doing it at the moment. And there's a lot of a lot of creative continents coming from the continent, <laughs> though we don't want to talk about continent, but there's a Kenyan company called The Nest and it's a collective. It's a collective and it deals with artistic artistic projects and they support throughout the arts. So they've done projects in fashion, projects in music, in visual arts, in in film as well, just to name but a few. So recently they published a book called Not Africa Enough because I think they, they thought of it as well that if something interesting is done from Africa, there's this question, are you really from Africa? <laughs> Did you grow up in Africa? How can you do this? I think this is why they say not African enough because it's satirical to some extent. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely. I mean, um, what I find interesting with, with the work that the NES does is that, um, on the one hand, it's not saying capitalism will save us, but on the other hand, it's saying, um, I need to be able to live from what I do. And I'm doing it passionately, and people around the world are getting paid to do way less interesting things that I'm doing but um, I need to be able to live from what I do. And this is a very empower empowering statement, um, not just for creatives, but for um, people looking for jobs, people who have been told um, study, um, study engineering because photography, you won't earn too much um, money, or study um, um, medicine because um, writing is not really, you know, you won't earn a lot of money. And so many people, um, the best writers are working in hospitals, the best um, photographers are working as engineers and stuff like that. And I think it's important to bring up this discussion in this context, um, not just in the context of creating, uh, not just in the context of, of pushing, pushing boundaries, not, that, not just in the context of asking the question, what is African? Like, why is Africa such a super concept. Uh, it's not just a name, it's not just a continent, it's, it's a concept, it's filled with so many things um, that are associated with it. When you mention Africa, things go flaring. Um, elephants, savannas, sunsets, um, hunger, drought, war, um, colors, um, palm, palm trees, like so many different things are filled into this concept. And artists, um, by way of working, have a very strategic, um, can, can make use of a very strate strategic approach to question what it means um, to be African. So when certain images are produced, um, and this is also work, all of, all of this is work by the, by the NEST Collective. Um, these are pictures from their book, the book Not African Enough. Um, so this book was, just a dream at some point. So somebody at the nest thought, okay, I love fashion, I want to do a book with fashion in it. 
and they started doing work for this book. So the book has 385 pages. And um, thinking about doing the book, they had to think about, okay, printing, they had to think about publishing, they had to think about photographers, videographers, um, stylists, all of these jobs. And um, the Kenyan industry, like I said, many people are doing these things part-time, so you won't find a website of somebody saying, hey, uh, I'm a photographer who specializes in fashion photography. You'll find a website or somebody on Facebook. I work at um, this and this hospital. And then it turns out that these people are actually very good photographers. And then the nurse gave them a platform. They told them, okay, um, we have a book. We want to make a book. Please come and work with us. And the results of your work will be published um, in a book which you'll hold. So from this one book, just one simple book, uh, they publish it themselves, by the way. Nobody in this collective has ever gone to publishing school, has ever done a degree in a related field. They are all, there's a doctor in the collective, there's a stylist, there's a, they're very different people, but they came together and created um, this book. So in creating this book, they create jobs, they create visions. So the idea of Afrofuturism actually becomes concrete. So thinking of, uh, of this future that everybody's talking about that nobody really knows what it talks about, you put a picture to this idea, you put an image to this idea, you deconstruct the usual images that we know um, and put new images to it. And I think this is a very powerful um, thing to do, not just in publishing, but in art, in photography, in all of these things that influence us on, on a daily basis. Um, the collective also um, created a series. Um, this is an, a web series, an interactive crime web series. And this series was interesting in many ways. Um, first of all, it was um, published entirely on Facebook. So um, it was a series created and they pitched it to television, they pitched it through the normal um, streams and everybody was like, ah, um, it's interesting, but it's it's not fit for our people. Don't want to see this. And then they put it on Facebook, and everybody was watching it. And then the companies were like, okay, okay, maybe people actually want to see it. And they caught, they invited them back to show the series on television. And why this series was very interesting is that it combined um, it combined a website. So um, Facebook, its own website, and um, the series. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of <coughs> mob justice or group justice. Does that end to say anything to any of you? Mob justice. No, mob justice. So the mob idea mob. of, yeah, the idea of um, people can decide, collectively decide, okay, this person did something, so we're going to punish them. And this is something that happens with petty crime in many African countries. So somebody who steals a mango because he's hungry can be killed because of doing that. So it's something that has happened um, and still happens. And this series was um, something like that because they're trying to say, okay, on the one hand, we have big shot criminals like people with Swiss bank accounts, right? And they get elected. They are on TV every day, living very lavishly, like throwing their wealth into your face. And then there's this guy who stole a mango because he's hungry and we kill him. Is, is that fair? So they were inviting people to think about this. And they put up a website and said, okay, um, every week we're gonna, it's fiction, don't forget, it's fiction. But in the website it said, every week we were a group of Nairobians, we are concerned about how our city is turning out, and every week we'll kidnap a criminal, right? So somebody who has done something will kidnap them, and we'll ask you to tell us what should happen to him. So you can vote online and decide what will happen to them. So they put out the first episode, um, and people are like confused. Uh, is this actually true? Like, can you actually vote? Um, so they watched the series, they went to the website, and they could actually vote. They were like, okay. Um, so they voted, and after the first episode, the decision from the website was used to determine the plot. 
So people said this person who had done this and this should be killed for doing that or should be spared for not doing that. And each episode is um, one of these stories. So each episode has a specific person who did something and the people are asked to decide, is this fair or is it unfair? What should we do to this person? All fiction, but this line between reality and, and um, um, reality and falsehood or reality and fiction was very thin and that was very innovative um, of this series. So I just show you a quick um, trailer. Kuna ina mbili wa kenya. Ya kwanza ni hili kwa babilu. Hawa waneza nanganya. Wanajiba. Apia waneza mada. Aina pili ni wale kama mimi. Mimi kubenda moja. Sidani ni fair. Nataka tufanye kitu kuhusu. So this, <coughs> this web series actually premiered in the Toronto Film Festival, I think, last year? Last year? Yeah, last year it premiered in the... Uh, 2016 it was in the Toronto Film Festival. And I think it's an example of just how people's stories, everyday stories, can be told on a global scale. Because the other thing that The Nest has done was to produ they produce as well another film about queer life in Kenya or, and the stories of people who are living as queers and it created a lot of, I think, so to say, tension and people went to prison because of the film but at the end of the day stories were told and uh, currently I think it's been shown in over 80 countries and who could imagine if we do something that can be seen across the world, 80 countries, from an idea to developing it to showing it. And I think these are just some of the things that we're seeing that are coming out from Nairobi at the moment. And just as part of film as well, there's the One Fine Day initiative, which was started by Tom Tigra and Marie in 2008, which does film as well, and they produce six films in Kenya. Uh, three of which have been in the process of being nominated to the, to the Oscars. That means they make best foreign film and then they choose who goes into the Oscars and some of these films as well have been nominated to this process. And in 2008 when they did it, they did their first film Soul Boy and Soul Boy was, was premiered in the Balinana in 2009 I think. 2009, and this year as well, they're doing the sixth film, which is being premiered as well in the Balinala next week, uh, next month. And it's a German Kenyan production where the German taxpayer gives money to the <laughs> to to this organization, and the money goes into developing African filmmakers. But what I find specifically interesting about this project is that. They give the money, but they do not. They do not tell you what to do with it. So what they do instead is they exchange knowledge, know-how. So you have mentors from Germany who come and help the African filmmakers who tell their own story. So the scripts, the production, the direct, the directors, they all come from Africa, but they just have their 
German mentor who was in the shadow in the process of making the film. And in 2014, I got the chance to play in one of their films called Veve. And the story is about the politics of Veve. Veve is a drug, it's, a, it's chat. I don't know how many of you know chat. They have, have it in, <laughs> they have it in, yeah, there's someone who knows chat. <laughs> they have it in, they have it in Yemen, in, in Yemen, in Jordan, they use it a lot, so it's a drug where you chew and then you become awake and you don't sleep. And it's a cash crop for some, to others it's a drug, but it's legal in Kenya, but now it's not, they can, we cannot really export it from Kenya anymore. Before we used to export it a lot, the biggest market was in the UK, but now we cannot, because they banned it, and in Amsterdam as well, in Netherlands. So this competition, this struggle for this drug and what people can do or how people learn from it. And this is the story of now how, this is the story being told in this baby, and anyone who's interested, they can watch it on Netflix. But I think we have the trailer, yeah. and we can play the trailer. Take a stem and feed it to your teeth. Okay. Just shoot. Okay. They're not fun. Okay. Wait, that's it. How do we do this month? Quite well. I want more than quite well. If you win the elections, yeah. when I win the elections. I need a governor. I'll have to give a race for age. We should become business partners because of the illegalities. I know it's a major problem. But it is one part cash cow. What can I say to Donald? So that was the film, and it premiered in the Hamburg Film Festival in 2014. And yeah, so I think at the end of the day, I think there's interesting content uh, content coming from the continent in the moment at the moment, and we are no longer the developing country, developing continent, so to say, because I find there's a lot of there's a lot of creativity the continent at the moment and I think we are living in a, at a time when one decides to do something you can go online and teach yourself how to do it so it's not like somebody who's in Germany is at, a, at an advantage compared to someone who's in Kenya or someone who's in Tanzania or someone who's in Namibia or if somebody's in Sweden they have an advantage I think the only gap is uh, in terms of development I think it's the finances because the resources that are available here is not necessarily what we have in Kenya, let's say. But there's always, there's a saying as well, African solutions for African problems. And this makes people ingenious and people can think out, outside the box because lacking these resources, you know that there's a, you have to find a way to do it, whether, whether you have the right equipment or not. And this is just the message I'd like us to take from this is that I think 
Africa is not the African people think. Africa is the now, and Africa is not the, because we have the future. Our people are saying Africa is the future, but I think, yeah, the future starts with the now. Before you get to where we're going, you have to start with now, and you have to have a vision, and then the future becomes the now as well, if that makes any sense. So. And um, I also think, um, like, asking ourselves how all of this fits into um, African futures or Afrofutures, um, before we even get to the sci-fi, um, because it's, it's very, at least for me, it's still very awkward for me to watch a film that has been shot completely in a language um, that I was born speaking. So when the NES first, they, they have a lot of films, and there's a film they shot in six to seven Kenyan languages. So it's a film of characters speaking to each other in Kikuyu, in Luo, in Turkana, in languages that you've never seen in you live in Kenya, you've lived in Kenya for 20 years, and you've never seen this language on a screen. And then you ask yourself, okay, how can it happen that I watch so much, you know, TV? Um, first of all, I never see myself, I never see people who represent me on the screen, even in local productions. And second of all, I never hear the languages that um, I speak on a day-to-day -day basis on the screen. And now you have people that are doing it. And um, it's a very tiny revolution, but it is a revolution. And um, it speaks to the fact that um, in the future, there will be more space because of people like the NES Collective who are, who are doing, presenting um, platforms for people to you know, act and speak in a language. You know, For many actors, it would be a problem if you can't speak English because they say, okay, if you don't speak English, we can't really cast you because that's not what we're looking, what we're looking for. But now uh, it's possible for actors and artists who do not speak English or who do not, um, cannot articulate themselves in ways that are considered global and in to present and tell their own stories. And for me, that's a very important moment um, to kind of, you know, a box to tick on the way to an African future. So that was what we were trying to contribute to this panel. Thank you so much, Sanford. <laughs>